following program is a special presentation of Fox Sports Net. Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. People love their cars and they love to race. Just four days left until the Great American Race and only one day until the uh, Twin 125s. As you get a look live at Daytona where there has been a morning fog delaying things uh, just a little bit as uh, Fox Racing continues its new labor of love, NASCAR. Right from Daytona International Speedway, our countdown to the big race continues. Don't forget the Twin 125s for the first time ever broadcast live noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, tomorrow, Thursday on Fox Sports Net. Hi, I'm Chris Myers, trackside here right above Victory Lane. And again, happy Valentine's Day from all of us to all of you. Mike Wallace, though, one driver not in love with his practice time so far. And for more on that and everything else going on today in the garage and pit area, let's head down to the guy who nobody loves to hate, Dick Berger. Dick? Well, thanks, Chris. Indeed, Mike Wallace timed 41st quick, and that's not nearly fast enough to qualify for the Daytona 500. He's going to have to race his way into the event tomorrow. Practice went well yesterday. He was sixth quick overall. How about it, Mike? What are you going to do tomorrow? Well, we're just going to race like we've been practicing the last couple days. You know, the nation's run forward has been really good yesterday and hopefully today yet in practice. And uh, the guys have done a great job. We didn't qualify well the other day, but the 125s, uh, I've been able to race my way in the last couple of years. Looking forward to doing it again. You can bet there's some worry on this team, however. Let's go to Steve Burns. Well, Dick, the return of Dodge to NASCAR racing has been a huge story, made even bigger by an all-Dodge front row for the 500. Bill Elliott and Stacy Compton stole all the headlines in qualifying, but quietly, very quietly, the three Dodge teams of Petty Enterprises have been improving. Yesterday, John Andretti was 12th fastest in practice, and Kyle Petty, garaged right next to him here, was 10th fastest, Genie Zalasco. Well, nothing quiet about Bobby Hamilton. He's been making a lot of noise in the garage, not just because he's been out on the track, but because he owns two trucks. He drives in the Bush Series with his son, and oh yeah, he has the commitment to the 55 car. And despite all of the distractions, he's been very consistent, posted a 15th fastest qualifying time. They feel the car is dialed in speed-wise. Today will be about some handling issues and trying to get the most out of their fuel. Chris? All right, thank you, Jeannie, and uh, happy Valentine's Day from down in the uh, garage and pit area. I want to welcome in here at our studio setup and just the guys I want to be with on Valentine's Day. <laughs> I, yeah, mean, I bet. No hugs, and, hugs and kisses, buddy. Uh, hugs and kisses. Easy now. Uh, 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 Jeff Hammond and uh, Ken Squire, and, and a happy Valentine's Day, gentlemen. But, Jeff, you've been through this as a crew chief. It's your last practice before the Twin 125s. You're gearing up for the Daytona 500, the big race. What's going through the mind of the crew chief and the team right now? Well, Chris, instead of a Valentine. Believe it or not, NASCAR threw a surprise inspection today. And what they did, based off some information they found at the wind tunnel test the other day, the teams have got supports at the gurney lip area on the rear spoiler. And what they found was they'd been putting some silicone in there. The silicone was blowing out, therefore making the cars get better as far as drag numbers are concerned. So therefore, as we look here on the screen, this is a gurney lip area. And what they were doing, it was blowing out. So therefore, NASCAR had a lot of these teams go and have to weld the holes up so they wouldn't let that air pass through. Silicone's out. That's the way it's got to be. So they weren't too happy about that. Yeah, that's the only lip you'll be kissing is a gurney <laughs> lip on Valentine. Well, you got a lot of work to do. Come on, just to set the record uh, straight, in just about an hour, the Winston Cup cars will be out practicing. Yeah. The Bush cars, their practice was canceled, but their qualifying will take place later in the afternoon, and we'll keep you up to date on, on all that. Uh, Ken, let's talk about that Dodge front row. Steve Burns had, had mentioned that, and even in the twin 125s, Bill Elliott on one pole, Stacy Compton on the other, they still won't get to do the ideal drafting, but that's something they want to do before Sunday's race. Oh, you bet. That's exactly what they're up to here they really want to get these things straightened out and know how they're going to do it's interesting to note that with bill elliott the first three times he was on the pole 85 86 92 
uh, for the 500. He won the 125 <coughs> qualifiers, and then last year he started on the outside of the front row. He was second there in that field. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he does when he runs this 125-mile qualifier tomorrow. And I'm more interested in what's going to happen with him in the race. Here's a guy with 624 starts on the pole for the Great American Race, and flanking him is this guy in uh, the Melling car with 33 Winston Cup starts. Two years ago, he was a truck driver, Craftsman Truck Series. Right. Darn good one, too. Uh, but there's a big difference in experience when they bring him down for the start on Sunday. That Elliott connection, Ernie Elliott, Bill's brother, with the engine that's in Stacy Compton's Dodge as well. Yes, you can't get away from the family connection in the Dodge program. One thing I'd like to point out, we talk about what Ray Everham it, it does, how much of a strategist he is. If you look at the way they picked out Pitt Road, Look who's beside the nine car. The 19 is in the pit right behind Bill Elliott. So, therefore, you look and see. Ray's always looking of a way to keep his teams together, keep his guys where they can draft. That brings up an interesting point. Why would you want your team cars back-to-back -back with, with the congestion that sometimes happens on pit road? Wouldn't you want them at least a space apart? You would think so, but at the same time, I think it's real important. He wants to be able to stand there and watch both crews operate and have influence on what's going on because that's that 19 car, as he told us earlier, is not assured a starting spot. So he's got to get this car in. And we uh, hope to be uh, talking with Ray Everham. If there's a moment, he'll come up to the set here and uh, join us today. All right, let's uh, go up to the broadcast booth where uh, Fox Racing's play-by-play -play crew are enjoying uh, their honeymoon, uh, if you can call it that. <laughs> uh, Mike Joy with his own crew chief and That's driver, terrible. Mike. <laughs> well, Chris, the last few days, it's been both bouquets and brickbats being tossed around here. A lot of difference of opinion, but controversy is good. Uh, there's been enough of it in the papers, and we'll have a little of it for you on TV. Now, we got a lot of emails and feedback from yesterday's telecast, so I want to pick up right where we left off. We were saying that the practice speed yesterday, in the grand scheme of things, were meaningless, Darrell Waltrip, because the teams all have different agendas. Now, you've yeah. had a chance to walk around and find out what some of those agendas are. Well, I was talking to one car owner this morning. you got to remember something. We're down here for 11 days. That car owner's got a lot of people down here, and he's got to keep everybody busy. But one of the things they're trying to figure out, and one of the things that they're doing is they practiced yesterday, just a kind of a throwaway practice, if you will, with just old practice engine, probably down 20 horsepower over their best race engine. They're going to put their race engine in today, and they're going to run it a little bit. This is a short practice, happy hour. Going to run that engine a little bit. They're going to take that engine back out, and they're going to put their qualifiers in for the 125. 125 miles, they figure the qualifiers will be able to take that. So uh, that's the engine program everybody's on, kind of different agendas for everybody. But I want to know something, Larry. Did you get to push out this thing or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some crew chiefs that have. There's some hadn't. But, th yeah, this is happy hour. It's the final practice before the 125s, even though it's Wednesday. Normally happy hour is not the Saturday. But most everywhere we race, you only get an hour, hour and a half at best to get ready to race. These guys have been practicing for the most part since Monday. I talked to some crew chiefs, the weather being like it is, they're happy with their cars. They just soon this practice didn't even go off. I talked to Mike Skinner's crew chief, Royce McGee, Kevin Hamlin, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. The engine tuners for those guys, they would like to get a few laps just to look at the distribution of the cylinders, make sure everything's good there. I talked to Michael McSwing, though, Ricky Rudd's crew chief. He said, Larry, this car has been pushing. The front end had been turning. We need, we're need we getting better, but we need one more practice to get this thing right. But the thing you don't want, this is the final practice. You don't want to get tangled up and have a problem. And in 1992, when I was part of winning the 500 with Davey Allison, in happy hour before the 125s, we crashed and had to go to a backup car. You know, I've been surprised, quite honestly. We've sat up here and watched practice for four days now, and, and I've been surprised three, four wide racing on the racetrack. I mean, really serious stuff. I've jumped out of my seat four or five times. My headset hit the floor a couple of times. They get really close together, but I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe I've seen a wheel mark on a car yet. So, uh... The intensity has been there the whole time, but I think you'll probably see a little bit calmer practice sessions today. We might see some Dale Jarrett's out there running by themselves again today. But I got, I, got to, I got to say this to my driver here. We've seen him running three wide. We've seen him running four wide. If I go out there and I see you run a little bit, that old car looks like it drafts up good and you're happy with the way it's driving, I stick my head in that window and say, old driver, how about if we cover this thing up and go to the beach? She's looking <laughs> mighty good. I'm with you, buddy. I'm all for it. All right, they have the infield grass all uh, freshly repainted for today, and we're getting set with practice. Winston Cup practice will be along in a bit. Until then, we get a chance to talk with some of the big names in the sport, including the defending champion of the Daytona 500, and we will do that next.
You're watching live from Daytona on Fox Sports Net. And welcome back live on Fox Sports Net in Daytona. Wait you see what we have for you. Just four days until the Daytona 500, you'll see the Great American Race on Fox. And that's what this is all about, leading up to the big race and the Twin 125s tomorrow. Dale Jarrett, by the way, in 98, won the Twin 125, and then, of course, went on to win the Daytona 500 that same year. He's a three-time winner of the Great Race and is standing by with our Jeannie Zalasco. Jeannie? mystery man of Speed Week. Everybody up in the booth speculating about what you have going on. So what's your agenda? Have you oh, been laying low? Oh, we're just wanting Daryl and Larry and Mike and all, everybody to talk about us. So, uh, you know, it's easier to see our car and, and get that camera on it if we're by ourselves. But, no, what we've been doing is working uh, on our car to make our car as fast as we can by itself. We make changes. It's hard to make changes and go out in a pack of cars and realize, really, if you've done anything to it. Certainly, if it's just a handling-type situation, I can tell that. But as far as actually picking up speed, and that's what we want to do is make our car as fast as we can. We realize, as everybody's talked about, we're at this disadvantage arrow-wise. So we knew that we had to make our car as fast as we could. Then I got out in the draft late yesterday afternoon to make sure that the changes we'd made, I could drive that in the draft, and I can. I'm very happy with my car. Are you going to make some friends today, then? Can we expect that? Uh, I'd like to make some. Didn't look like I had very many on Sunday, so uh, hopefully we'll make a few more. We'll get out in the draft today and uh, see what we can do. All right, thank you. Steve? Hey, thanks, Jeannie. We talked about the Petty Enterprises team. The third driver is Buckshot Jones. Buckshot, you're going to start 15th in your 125-miler. How comfortable are you with making the 500? What is your strategy right now? Right now, you know, pretty comfortable. We've been trying to make long runs to see what the car will do. Um, still, there's a few things we got to get worked out. It seems like everybody's a little bit tied up off of two. But, you know, out there running, I feel real comfortable. I just got to stay out of the wreck. If there is one, hopefully there won't be, and, and be there at the end. It's kind of hard to say who you can run with and what line you need to be in, because it seems like you can go from the front to the back, I mean, from the back to the front, and vice versa, in no time. So it's a, it's a lot different than the bush race. All right, thanks, Buckshot. Good luck. All right, and a quick uh, correction, 97, Dale Jarrett won the uh, Twin 125s, of course, in 98. That was Dale Earnhardt, and I don't want the Intimidator <laughs> to be <laughs> aggravated don't at all. Don't make him come after uh, you. That'll be trouble. Ray Everham uh, was going to come up and, and chat with us, but he said he had some priorities now that the uh, racing right. has, or the practicing, I'm sorry, has been pushed back because of the fog, the Winston Cup practice. And, and Jeff, it's important, and you talked to them this morning in the garage area, that he does get some last-minute work done, even though he's, he's fine with Bill Elliott. Well, just to go to show one other thing, he is still a hands-on crew chief. I mean, he may be the owner, but he's still got crew chief tendency. So what's going on is, we were talking to him earlier. I walked up to him and said, hey, Ray, did you finally get you a good night's sleep Sunday night or Saturday night after qualifying? He said, no, as a matter of fact. He said, I didn't. And the reason being is Casey Atwood. Bill Elliott may be on the pole, but the 19 car is in jeopardy of going home. It has no points to speak of, and he's got a rookie driver in the car. He doesn't know how this kid's going to react when it comes to the 125s. So he's trying to stay in that kid's head, you might say, really stay close to him, work with him, make sure that he knows that I am focused on your car and so that Casey's got all the confidence in the world. And I still think that's the reason why they're pitted so close together, so that he can be there in case there's a situation. He can step in and give that credibility to it. Yeah, and Ken Ray Everham, I mean, he chose the veteran in Elliott and the, uh, the, you know, the youngster in Atwood, and heading up the Dodge team, as, as the, all of the Dodge cars work together, these two are working more closely together. Yeah, yeah, he is, without question, one of the coolest customers here. Since 1992, he had 47 wins, all with Jeff Gordon. And this changeover, he is not taking lightly, but he's still one of those customers that just comes off so easy with everyone down there. But you know the pressure is building on him, particularly about that Atwood car. Yeah. All right, speaking of Dodge, let's get out of Dick Bergen in the garage and pit area. And uh, Dick, it's something you've been looking into. How different, really? What kind of disparity is there in the Dodge engine parts compared to some of the other cars that we've seen? Well, Chris, externally, the Dodge engine visibly is different than either the Chevy engines or whatever else you might see over in the garage area. But I want to take a look inside the engines and see how similar they really are. Now, CP, a manufacturer in California, makes pistons, and look at these pistons. They look pretty much alike. Believe it or not, this piston fits a Chevrolet. This piston fits a Dodge. All those identical. Now, pistons connect to what's called connecting rods. There's the three connecting rods that are used for the three principal brands that are here. Chevrolets run uh, in Pontiacs, by the way, so if you see a Pontiac, it's really got a Chevrolet engine. They look pretty similar. They ought to. This one fits a Chevy. This connecting rod, believe it or not, would fit right inside either a Chevrolet or a Dodge engine. Down here, they put an engine bearing. Guess what fits? Honda. What's important about this is that the internal workings of that Dodge engine 
have largely come from the aftermarket. The aftermarket's got 30 years of building components for Winston Cup engines, and that's good because that improves the probability that the Dodges, just like all the rest of these guys, are going to be around at the end of the day on Sunday. All right, thank you very much, Dick. We have our own Jeff Hammond, who's a crew chief of six different uh, Winston Cup uh, championships when he was active. And, of course, won the Daytona 500 when he had uh, Daryl Walter as his driver. And he always carries, you know, he carries that restrictor point around with him. He also has an engine that he's standing by. So let's go over to Jeff right now. Yeah, just for those at home who don't quite understand what Dick was trying to say, inside here, this is the block. This is the cylinder hole here. And down inside, as you can look, is where the piston is located. These are the valves, spark plugs. These are the different uh, water pump areas. But as the piston goes down and comes up inside the cylinder here, the gasoline comes in, spark plug ignites it, and actually, this is the exhaust right here. This is where the exhaust goes out after it. The, the, uh, I guess you call it the explosion occurs inside the cylinder head and cylinder wall. This is what makes the motor go up and down. It makes horsepower. Jeff, I have another uh, question related to the uh, body style because I know some of the, the, the people who have Ford said, hey, it's similar. They took the same kind of a body arrangement, aerodynamics, that Ford has, and they're using that for Dodge and being very successful with the Dodge and Trepid. Well, what they did, Chris, was NASCAR is still looking toward the future of trying to have what they call common templates. They'd like for every car, whether it's a General Motors, Chevrolet, Pontiac, whether it's a Ford or a Dodge, they'd love for everybody to have basically the same templates as far as the overall silhouette of the car, the cross width of the car. The only differences they'd like to see are in the nose areas where you can identify exactly what brand it is. It simplifies their job, plus that's their way of keeping the playing field level. Yep, and already things are different. They're Dodge different. Dodge on the front row for the Daytona 500. Our Winston Cup practice are coming up here in about 30 or 40 minutes, and you'll see it. Live right here on Fox Sports Net as we continue from Daytona, Florida with Jeff Hammond and Ken Squire. I'm Chris Myers. Happy Valentine's Day. We'll be back in a moment. Get into the action. Get into the excitement. Welcome back on Fox Sports Net. We're live in Daytona. More than 200,000 people will be here Sunday, so those fans, grandstands will be filled. People who love their drivers and love to watch racing will see the great American race right here on Fox and on Fox Sports Net. Back in 1959, Lee Petty won Dodge's very first race at West Palm Beach in this area and throughout the 70s. Dodge Chargers ruled the stock car world. Now, after 20 years being on the sidelines, Dodge is back and in a big way. Ed Herman now gives us a preview of the Dodge Countdown to Daytona pre-race show, which airs this Sunday at 11.30 Eastern before Fox's coverage of the Great American Race. Hello, I'm Edward Herman. You may have seen me in one of the many television commercials I've done for Dodge. Well, today, I'm here in a different role. I'm going to take you on a journey and tell you a story. The story of Dodge and Winston Cup stock car racing. It is a fascinating story about why a company that bowed out at the very top of the sport in the 1970s has decided to recapture its former glory. Richard Petty, David Pearson, Bobby Allison, those were the names that filled the airwaves when stock car racers got together on Sunday afternoons in the 1970s. At one time or another, Petty, Pearson, and Allison all drove Dodges into victory lane. And Petty, the king of stock car racing, won three of his seven championships at the wheel of a Dodge Charger. But as the 70s wound down, Dodge parked its cars and left NASCAR. Today, names like Earnhardt, Gordon, Jarrett and Elliott are heard on Sunday afternoons. And starting with the 2001 Daytona 500, the name Dodge is back in the lineup. Jim Julo, a Dodge vice president, made it his personal quest to put the car maker back in stock car racing. On Thursday, October 14th, 1999, Julo summoned the media to New York City to make a momentous announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It was now official. Dodge was getting back into Winston Cup racing. But there was more. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Ray Everingham. It was also announced that Ray Evernham, one of the most successful crew chiefs in stock car racing, was leaving Hendrick Motorsports and driver Jeff Gordon. Dodge introduced its teams and drivers for the 2001 NASCAR Winston Cup season in a series of media events like the one in Atlanta. In addition to Elliott in the number nine, 
Everham Motorsports would field the number 19 car for rookie Casey Atwood. Petty Enterprises would field Kyle Petty in the number 45 Sprint-sponsored entry. John Andretti in the number 43 Cheerios car. And rookie Buckshot Jones in the number 44 Georgia Pacific machine. Bill Davis Racing would have Ward Burton in the number 22 Caterpillar car and Dave Blaney in the Amico number 93. Chip Ganassi Racing's two entries would be Sterling Marlin in the number 40 Coors Light Car and rookie Jason Leffler in the number 01 Bell South Machine. And finally, the one-car operation of Melling Racing would send Stacy Compton to the line in the number 92 Kodiak-sponsored Dodge. And at the center of it all was Bill Elliott, the veteran driver who could tell Evernham how the car handled and share advice with Casey Atwood and Stacy Compton. This was the one-team concept in action. By this point in the one-team effort, no matter where they went, the man in charge was Ray Evernham. And Evernham knew that the organization he was building was not unlike any other professional sports team. This is Lowe's Motor Speedway outside Charlotte, North Carolina, the very center of American stock car racing. On November 14th and 15th, 2000, as the countdown clock dipped below 100 days until the Daytona 500, all five Dodge teams and most of the drivers were here to test. Lap times were impressive, with Sterling Marlin running times equal to what he had turned in a Chevrolet during qualifying at Charlotte just five weeks earlier. You know, this time next year, I hope we're gonna be sitting you know, somewhere in the top five in points and got us two or three wins, and uh, I don't think it's totally out of question. I think we can do it. What began many months ago in Detroit finally came to an end at Daytona International Speedway, about 450 miles south of here, with the beginning of Speed Weeks 2001. With that beginning, it was evident that NASCAR would never be the same again. Dodge had made things different, and it brought a whole new approach to the sport of stock car racing. It took five race teams and made them one. It hired a head coach, Ray Evernham, to lead that team. And it built a brand new race car from the ground up. Would Dodge win its first race, or its second, or third? No one could know. But everyone did know one thing. 30 years after the legendary high-wing Dodge Daytonas thundered around racetracks and into victory lane, Dodge was back. The countdown was over. The racing had begun. And you get a live look at Ray Everham. He's getting ready to go to work because the Winston Cup practice will be taking place here on the Speedway within the next 20 or 30 minutes. Right now, the trucks are zooming, and later on, the Bush qualifying will take place as you get a look at Stacy Compton's Dodge there as well. So remember they had the uh, dodge daytona car well it's been dodge daytona so far this week is on the pole bill elliott and stacy compton so it's an all dodge front row with the jerry nadu the disqualification of course richard petty the king the only dodge driver to win the daytona 500 he did that in 73 and 74. sunday on fox more on dodge get the complete picture as uh, they are back on the racing scene 11 30 eastern then our free race show at noon eastern and the great american race will be exciting the 43rd running of the daytona 500. we'll be back live in a moment. Time to hit the garden. A muddy in the Hawks. Messier in the Ranger. Let's get it out. Blackhawks Ranger, Monday at 11.30. This is Direct TV, the number one digital satellite entertainment service. Now available with the $200 mail-in rebate. Order today and get more channels with 100% digital quality picture and sound. And you can see the sun breaking through the fog, a lifting Winston Cup practicing the final practice before the Twin 125s tomorrow. This is live on Fox Sports Net. They're taking place within the half hour. We'll get to that practice as soon as the uh, cars get out on the track. And now let's join the uh, host of Totally NASCAR. You see it on the Fox Sports Net every Monday through Friday at 6 Eastern. He's in the garage area. Steve Burns. Steve? Thank you for the plug there, Chris. We'll have you on sometime. <laughs> let's set the Brett Bodine story. Brett, you go off 23rd in your 125-mile qualifier, but you, uh, you were the second round fastest qualifier what does all that mean in terms of your comfort level for making sunday's race well actually we're 21st fastest overall if you take both rounds of qualifying combine them we're 21st fastest overall I feel like that's pretty safe you know historically the 25s are what you go by top 25 in speed top 25 in point standings pretty much guaranteed to be in the 500. Uh, our, our whole 
mission tomorrow is we want to start as far forward in the Daytona 500 as possible. Start 23rd in our 125. We've got some work to do. Got a fast race car. You know, we just got to have the brakes go our way. Some lanes open up. Try to catch up to that lead draft. Hopefully it doesn't split apart, get in two groups. But, uh, you know, we just got to see what we can do. Feel like we got a great shot. Uh, this is probably the best race car I've had here since the early 90s, back when I drove for Kenny Bernstein. So we're very excited about our chances. All right, thanks, thanks, Brett, and thank you for understanding, explaining qualifying. <laughs> Let's go to Dick Berger. Thanks. Since Daytona opened in 1959, there's been a game going on between the mechanics and NASCAR. The mechanics just want to go faster. NASCAR wants to make all the cars the same. One of the most interesting versions of this game has happened here in the Bush Grand National Garage this week, and it has to do with rear springs. Mechanics want to run springs as soft as they possibly can to get the back end of the car down out of the air so they'll go through the air faster. S NASCAR, however, has really tightened up the rules, and on this table right now, are 70, count them, 70 springs that NASCAR has decided did not pass muster. Some too tall, some too short, some too weak. And the game goes on. They just grabbed another one. Let's go to the booth. Mike. Well, in other sports, in football, if you have an infraction, you're penalized 5, 10, or, or 15 yards. So these are infractions, Larry? Well, Let's just call them uh, working in the gray area. That's what, how we like to refer well, I, to it. I've seen the rule book. It's printed in black and white. <laughs> well, but the thing about it, in, in the rate, those was Bush Grand National Springs for the rear. NASCAR says the Bush cars cannot run softer than a 415-pound spring in the rear. Now, what that means is it takes 415 pounds of force to compress that spring one, one inch. inch. One inch. Same in Winston Cup, but it's 350 pounds in Winston Cup. But as competitive as we are, the crew chiefs, we'll go get 10 rear springs. And if we have run one that rates 419, uh-uh, I want one that rates 415. But if you show up at NASCAR and it rates 414, they got another spring in their little inventory. <laughs> yeah, and those things cost, what, about $100 a piece? So, 100, uh, 100 and a quarter. They're yeah, not cheap. They're not cheap, and they're special made. A lot of the springs for down here for Daytona, they have a real wide coil wind to them real a lot of space so they won't coil bind as the car travels up and down here the softer that spring it gets that rear spoiler out of there we keep oh, going yeah. back to the 25 car their goal on saturday when they qualified was try to get that rear spoiler out of there because a little bit can mean a lot well just think about it from the ground let me just the spoiler is sticking up on the back of the car so if it's at the right height it's supposed to be say that's uh 50 inches and if you can get that thing to come down, that rear spoiler to come down to 48 inches, that's two inches lower out of the air. Make the car go that much faster. How aerodynamic are those sunglasses? Oh, do I still have my glasses on? Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Uh, now, in victory lane, folks, it's, it's, it's well known. It's been in print. <laughs> if the race-winning driver in a cup race mentions his sunglass company, even if it's a night race, and you know, he's got those sunglasses on, uh, his wallet gets a little heavier. But I'm, I'm not sure that. Oh, no, I don't, I'm out. Are of, you on so I'm, not, I'm not a driver anymore, so I can... Can, I you can, wear get, anything. can you get Mike and I on a sunglass deal? I can do that. Okay. I can get you okay. a pair of glasses. As long as you can get us on the deal. But I, you know, I'm not on the deal anymore. I'm just a TV analyst now. <laughs> <laughs> I never say just. Lowly, <laughs> lonely, TV analyst. Our hero. Let's uh, meet somebody else who's got a sunglass deal. Here's Jeannie. <laughs> well, I'm still working on that sunglass deal. For, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Robert Flesley got the shades on. and you got to be uh, a little calm before the storm here. you got the 125 engine in today? Yeah, we got our 125 engine in getting ready to go. And cut practice a little bit short, so we got to make uh, use of every bit of this time. But I think we'll be all right. Yesterday we got a little practice there. Uh, car run good, drafted good, so get ready for the 125. Qualifying time may be a little deceiving because you're saying that the car feels pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we was really disappointed with their qualifying, just never got going, you know, from the start. So we're going to be starting in the back of the 125, but we'll get out here, see how the car's going to draft, and get ready for tomorrow. Steve. Mike? Thanks, Jenny. Robert Presley trying to race his, and even our cameramen in the garage have their own deal. That's a DW cam. I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the nice thing is the fog is lifted and it's bright enough to need those. Well, that's why I, I didn't just put them on for the heck of it. You know, we got sunshine. <laughs> we got lots of it. And we're going to have Winston Cup cars out here shortly for their practice session. You're watching live from Daytona International Speedway. We'll be right back with you. This is NASCAR on Fox Sports Net.
five of Daytona. The Winston Cup car is getting ready to practice. And can you believe it's only four days until the Daytona 500? You'll see it and hear it on Fox this Sunday. Be with us Saturday. We got a good one on Fox as well. It's the Napa 300. Joe Gibbs is thinking about the Daytona 500, but uh, we'll have the uh, Bush race, the Napa 300, live on Fox Saturday. 12.30 Eastern, pre-race coverage with our guys here, and then, of course, post-race coverage. It's the Bush Grand National Napa 300. And speaking of that, the points champion from last year, glad to have with us, Jeff Green. Nice okay. to see you. Thanks Good for coming you. by. And uh, let's talk about, first of all, your practice session because of the fog thrown out today. But you do have the qualifying session later this afternoon as you go for another championship and an improvement in the uh, Napa 300. How did that affect your preparation? I don't think it affected us any. Um, got a great crew chief and a great bunch of guys with the Nesquik guys. And uh, we tested here a, a month ago. And uh, we feel like we know what we need. Um, maybe to give... Maybe to give us a better opportunity to have a better time. Uh, some of the guys, the more they get on the racetrack, tend to to catch up with us. So I don't. We're not a threat for the pole, but we want to try to get in the top ten. Uh, this race can be won from anywhere. So uh, we just want to try to have a good time and uh, just you know get our season started off a little bit better than we did last year. Well, you had the, uh, yeah. the uh, uh, little mishap there. Yeah. Uh, ten uh, Bush career victories, six of those last year. But I guess one of the stories, and uh, Jeff Hamm was telling me even before we knew you were coming up here, hey, you were a Chevy last year. Now you're a Ford guy. Why? Well, we feel like that, uh, you know, our sport is changing by the day, and uh, the Bush Series is, is, is a big change this year. So uh, we feel like the Ford Taurus will allow us to make our team better and to stay ahead of these guys. We were ahead of them all last year, and to stay ahead of those guys, we feel like we have to work in the future, and uh, the Ford Taurus and the Ford people have allowed us to hopefully to do that. <laughs> I mean, you're sitting there saying they're allowing you to do that. Last night, you pretty much beat everybody <laughs> into submission a year ago. I mean, everybody just, I mean, you had the championship locked up. Was that, I mean, did that take any thrill out of it, Jeff? Not really. Uh, you know, Jeff, you know, you've known me for a long time, and I've been working <laughs> for this for a championship. Easy. <laughs> championship for well a few years I'm sorry okay, that's right, a few uh, years. <laughs> for a championship run like we had and uh, we could I would wanted to wrap it up the first race but we didn't we, we, we couldn't do that and uh, our philosophy every week is uh, is to go out and try to win that particular event and that's what we focused on through Homestead whether we were the champion or not uh, we were lucky enough we were able to uh, to wrap that thing up a couple races to go and that just allowed us to do, you know really do a little bit more things with our race car and, and take a few more chances but uh, we just go after each race like it's the last one and try to win that particular event. Well, Jeff, I mean, he said uh, he said beat submission. Let's take a look at the points and the difference in, in the field of how it was by more than, what, 600? Uh, my calculator can't even figure out the difference there. <laughs> and look, you got some guys, you're Ron Horn today, you got Casey Atwood that are that are Winston Cup uh, drivers that, that, that are giving it a shot. That's uh, that's pretty impressive to think that it started with, and maybe you can talk about that that crash in last year's in Napa 300 that you, you obviously really, you made You really pretty much put yourself in a hole and you yeah. put yourself out in a big way. Yeah, we left here in 42nd position so we're 42nd in the points leaving the Napa 300 last year and uh, you know very disappointed that particular day but I, I got myself in that own hole as my own deal of doing I, I turned myself over basically I, I cut up in front of Bobby Hampton Jr. and uh, just you know just thought I had enough room I didn't but uh, I got a great race team and I knew that going to we went to Rockingham finished second there and that was just you know that got our ball rolling basically and uh, like I said earlier, we just tried to win each particular event. If we couldn't do that, we tried to be in the top five. And uh, after the year was over, we had five, uh, 25 top fives. So that's what wins championships. Wins are very special to me. The six wins that I won last year was very, very special. But those top those top fives is really special to me, too. Yeah, Jeff Green and David Green, your brother, of course, in 94. You're the only brothers uh, who have won... Uh Bush Championship Series and the history of the series, and also uh, Mark is another one. So it's mm -hmm. a it's a driving family and successful. Have fun out there. We look forward to watching you on Saturday. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Appreciate that. Jeff Green with us, and let's go uh, to uh, Dick Bergman, who is standing by with Jerry Nadeau in the garage area. Dick. Well, it, it may be Valentine's Day right now, but Jerry Nadeau is not in love with this year's Speed Weeks. He qualified second quick. NASCAR disallowed the time, found some parts in the car that they didn't care for. And other than that one run in, in draft and all the rest of it, Jerry just hasn't been fast. And the question is, how do you keep your confidence up with all that's been going on, Jerry? Uh, it's, to be honest, it's not a big deal. I think everybody does it. Uh, fortunately, we got caught uh, doing something pretty bad. But, uh, I mean, I have a lot of confidence in the race team. This team's always done well. We won the last race of the year last year. This car's a good draft and race car. I mean, uh, it, unfortunately, it just doesn't qualify good. So, uh, you know, we'll just see how it goes. Yesterday, we were in the top 15 in uh, practice speeds. And today, we're just going to try a few, make a few adjustments and see if we can make it a little bit better in race mode. But I'm still happy, even though it's Valentine's Day. 
Tomorrow we're going to watch the 125s on Fox Sports Net. How hard are you going to run in that event? I'm going to drive my butt off. I mean, that's what I'm here for. Uh, I'm here to win races, and I think, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we got to start dead last, but I think what's nice about starting dead last is you can, you can kind of pick your way through the field, and uh, if we judge it right, we can end up somewhere in the top five by the end of the race. So I think we got a good enough car to get up there. If I can get enough help and work, you know, enough uh, work with all the other people out there, um, this car seems to handle really good after 30, 40 laps, where a lot of other guys start getting loose and getting a little bit tight on the racetrack. So uh, I, feel, I got a lot of confidence in this race team. Okay, we wish you well. Back to Chris. All right, thanks, Dick. Jerry Nadeau uh, won his uh, only Winston Cup event uh, last year, the last race of the season in Atlanta. We continue live coverage at Fox Sports Net. The Winston Cup cars get ready to practice here, and you'll see them with our gang here from Daytona International Speedway on Valentine's Day. Don't go away. Back on Fox Sports Net. And hope you'll be with us tomorrow at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, a history making event regarding NASCAR and television. The Twin 125, the Gatorade Twin 125, will be broadcast live. First ever live telecast of that all important race that Dale Earnhardt actually won 10 straight times through the 90s. He's won it 12 times. For more on the lineup, let's go upstairs to Mike Joy. Thank you, Chris. Uh, just a few minutes before Winston Cup practice, you saw Derek Cope climb in there, get ready to go. Larry McReynolds has some analysis of the grids for tomorrow. Well, well, as a crew chief, once qualifying's over, even though there's nothing you can do about it, you're in the race that you're going to be in, you start looking. What's the toughest race? And don't get me wrong, there's fast cars in both races, but... DW, I looked at the last 11 Daytona 500s all the way back to 1989 when you won it, and I'm looking experience. You know, you've, you've got, you've got a, a lot of the past Daytona 500 winners that's in the first race. In fact, all of them that includes in that. You know, you look here, you got Dale Earnhardt who's won in everything but the pace car here. And you got Jimmy Spencer that has won here, but it was in the Pepsi 400. You got Derek Cope who won this race in 1990. Again, everybody that has won the Daytona 500 for the last 11 years is in the first race. You got John Andretti who's won here, but again, it was in the July Pepsi 400. Here's another Pepsi 400 winner. In fact, last year, but again, nobody in the second 125 has ever pulled the victory lane in the Daytona 500. Hmm. So, uh, Coach, uh, Chief, which race are we in anyway? Let's let's go ahead and let's be in the second. Let's be in the second. I like that. <laughs> You've won the Daytona 500. I like, I like that. And I've won the Daytona 500. See, I always like the second one because you stand on the top of the truck and watch the first one, and you see how crazy they are. You say, I ain't going to do that. I'm not going to drive like that. I'm, no way I'm going to act that way. You know, in the last 34 years, only 10 of those 125s have run caution free. Really? I, I, I hope... Well, I, I don't mean, I hope, yeah, I do. I hope that they do Sunday or uh, Thursday because I'd like to see who can make it on fuel because that seems to be somewhat of a concern, particularly since NASCAR has taken uh, the fuel, sand, fuel cell cans away from a bunch of them. Yeah, that's a big concern over Thursday is fuel mileage. Jeannie. Well, Derek Cope with the fifth fastest practice time on Tuesday says, yeah, it gave him a nice lift, a nice boost of confidence, but he is really pleased, maybe with the rest of us, to see a little sunshine out here. He says it'll finally be a good barometer of how the car will run in the 125. While he may have picked up some speed on Tuesday, the car is still tighter than he would have liked. He's got to get that dialed in in the next hour. There's a lot of dual sport athletes in NASCAR. A lot of folks feel Dale Jarrett could have been a pro golfer if he wasn't a racer. Derek Cope was a catcher, and I believe the Chicago Cubs farm system. Knee injury ended his baseball career, but well, he's had quite a racing career. Yeah, he has. You know, one thing that's always interests me, Larry, or not interests me, but always amazed me, back not too terribly long ago, the crew chief and the engine builder and everybody say, all right, well, go out, run around on the bottom of our lap, Jim, get, all, get everything warmed up, get your gear warmed up, get your transmission warmed up, get a little heat in that engine before you take off. Don't anybody warm up anything anymore. They no. come out of the gum garage and they're tearing gears and going wide open with no, just right, like they've been out there all day. Well, you know, the motor with the restrictor plate, it don't like to be what we call park throttle. In other words, sitting out there just cycling, it, it will burn a piston. So now what they're doing, they're warming not only the motors up in the garage area like always, but they jack the rear end up, warm the transmission up, warm the rear end up, and all right there on jack stands in the garage. Well, one of the biggest fears I always have is, uh, 
not really trying to bring up any bad memories, but here it's not so bad. If something happens to the car, you got a little bit of escape route, I guess. But if uh, guys at some of these racetracks go out and do that, what if something happens to the car, you know? What if there's an oil line loose, you get oil on the rear tires and spin out? What if the throttle hangs wide open? I always think that a lap or two around the racetrack at half, you know, slow speed is not a bad idea. No, it's not. There see Ward Burton in the yellow and black car there catching this pack. They're two by two in front of him. It has enabled him within about a half lap to pull right up to him. 26 race cars on track right now. Again, NASCAR uh, controlling the flow of cars out onto the speedway. And we'll have 26 cars in each of the qualifying races tomorrow. That's, uh, that's eight more than, I mean, we saw 18 cars this past Sunday in the Budweiser shootout. So we're only going to have eight more race cars on the track with 20 less laps. So we should see a very similar race, assuming that everybody can run 50 laps on gas. The first qualifying race at Daytona was when the Speedway was brand new in 1959. They ran at 100 miles. Nice even round number. Shorty Rollins won it on the last lap from Glenn Wood, who is the owner of the 21 team. First 100 milers was run for NASCAR convertible division cars. Something not seen in, oh, about 40 years on the speedway. You saw Dale Earnhardt, he dipped down low on the backstretch. That slow car right there, in fact, that was Jerry Nadeau. He was getting up to speed on the backstretch, but Dale moved that line down because even though that car wasn't quite up to speed, it was still poking a hole in the air for them where they could pick up speed in the draft. That's what the crew chief will tell you, particularly in the race, draft anything that moves, including the face car, <laughs> particularly if you're trying to save a little fuel. These races started out at 100 miles. In 1968, they were both rained out, the only time that's happened. And NASCAR took a look at it and said, you know, this race would be a lot more interesting with a pit stop, and those cars could go 100 miles on a tank of fuel, and that's why in 1969, the race length was increased to 125 miles, which it is today. With the smaller restrictor plates that we run over the past few years, making it on fuel was not an issue. But when they went to the bigger plate this year, the 15 16 plate, more power takes more fuel. Now, one of the things that's interesting, you've heard people talking about getting their cars to drive good. When a car is pushing, there's Dale Earnhardt. They got on him yesterday about dipping below that yellow line on April. In fact, they black flagged a few cars. But when your car is pushing, Daryl, and the front wheels are, are scrubbing, the car is binding up. And it's using more fuel because the motor's struggling. So you definitely don't want your car pushing. you got to have it turning here, and that helps the fuel miles. Oh, yeah. Getting in now, the throttle's not a good thing either because you work the squirters in the carburetor. You burn just a teeny bit more fuel. So you got to be gentle. I always try to drive my car, particularly when I'm trying to save fuel, just like it had an egg on top of the accelerator. Ever so gently. Uh, 77, Robert Presley, he'll be the first driver to get the black flag for... Uh, going off the intended racing surface there. Now, you saw an interesting draft where Earnhardt in the three, Wallace in the two, Gordon in the 24, was able to break out ahead of this pack. They kind of left uh, Ward Burton out to dry, and now he's going to get clotheslined as the middle car between two drafts. We've seen this all week. You know, you get a line on the outside, you get a line moving on the inside, and there you're stuck in the middle, and when you finally get in line is when the spotter says, clear behind the last car. Let's get an update on Jeremy Mayfield, whose times have not been very fast this week. Dick Bergman. Mike, he didn't even make a single lap on the racetrack. He's brought the car back in here to the garage area. The engine is missing. They've changed several engines in this car trying to find some speed. This one just is not up to snuff. He's the only car in the garage right now. I was here one year with Junior Johnson. We were struggling a lot like uh, Jeremy is. We put 12 different engines in our car. And guess wow. what? Guess what? Every one of them ran the same. <laughs> So we came to a conclusion, Junior and I did, after that many engines, it must be the car. And then later on, Junior said, no, I think it's the driver, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Winston Cup practice for tomorrow's 125-mile qualifiers. You'll see those live here on Fox Sports Net. And the practice times are displayed coming uh, out of our Fox box on the upper left of the screen. Our new Fox ticker with car number driver name and position at the top and that second line will show you a variety of information we showed you lap times here are the practice speeds from this morning's session in miles per hour and the fox box will always tell you when the track is under green flag condition or caution hey daryl 
you didn't have to bring back those good memories, did you? Especially, uh, I remember that uh, particular weeks weeks here at uh, Daytona was probably one of the most miserable times I've ever spent here of us trying to make a car run. And it wasn't the first time that I think teams have run in that situation where you couldn't get a car to run. And it wasn't necessarily the engine, but guys at that time really hadn't developed the technology of understanding how important it was to have a slick car and getting it proper attitude going down the racetrack. Yeah, Junior's philosophy was just give it more power, it'll run. That's what he always thought. Those power so. cures everything, That's you know just, that. That always, that always made the driver smile and uh, everybody was happy. Jeff, didn't the teams then, ooh, tag. Jeff, did Jeff Gordon just get tagged by Mark Martin? It's a good chance because they ran up on a slow car going in that corner and they got mighty tight. He also looked like he dipped those left side wheels on that apron, and even though that's paved down there, it's, it's a different elevation or different degree as the actual banking of the racetrack, and it will throw you back up the racetrack just like it did, Jeff, and looks like he's regrouping there, Darrell. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> I can guarantee you right now, Robbie Loomis is saying, why don't you get out of there and come on in? That's that crew chief thing, you know. Yes. Uh, Jeff, at that time, the, didn't the teams understand how the car would look good to the wind, but did they really understand what a quarter inch here or there in the wind tunnel would make such a huge difference back then? Well, we would do things back then to the, we do things, oh, here we go, we're gonna look at this again because this, this is worth looking at again. Here they go down in, uh, yeah, he, look, he got Jeff, Wow. Mark got Jeff uh, sideways right there. Here's another look at it. Here they come down into turn three. And uh, this car here, that slow car is really what creates this. And Gort, uh, Mark tries to go under Jeff. Jeff cuts down. And man, the back end of that car just came right around. Nice, nice save. What you'll also see is watch how Gordon loses his momentum and the drivers in the outside lane uh, stream right by him. Anytime you get the least little bit out of shape there. <laughs> well, yeah, out of shape and out of the gas. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Agree. So Gordon will uh, go to the garage, as Earnhardt has just done, make some changes to the car, come back out, run a few more laps. You know what I love about our coverage? Now, I've been watching this stuff all my life, folks. I've sat in the garage, and I've wondered what was going on on the race. I've watched this stuff on TV for years. We have shown every little thing that has happened out on this racetrack ever since we got here Friday. I mean, it's exciting to sit up here and watch. I know the guys in the garage are loving it because they don't even have to buy their trucks. <laughs> Winston Cup practice continues, getting set for tomorrow's Gatorade 125-mile qualifying races. Teams atop the haulers taking careful notes. And Johnny Benson has just climbed to the top of the speed chart over his teammate Ken Schrader and then Bill Elliott. You're watching Practice at Daytona on Fox Sports Net. Tomorrow here on Fox Sports Net, the Gatorade 125. Saturday on Fox, the Napa 300, and then on our sister station, FX, NASCAR Winston Cup happy hour Saturday afternoon. Sunday, wall-to-wall -wall NASCAR this morning at 10 a.m. Daytona 500, our coverage starts at 11.30 Eastern. And then NASCAR Victory Lane wraps it all up for you every Sunday night at 9 p.m. here on the net, Fox Sports Net. A few minutes ago, going toward turn three, the six of Mark Martin got into the back of Jeff Gordon's number 24. Got him pretty well sideways. Things got all straightened out. Gordon's now in the garage with Steve Burns. Thanks, Mike, for following up with Jeff Gordon here. Jeff, saw you talking to Dale Earnhardt, talking about a hairy moment, perhaps, on the racetrack. Please tell me you guys got that. <laughs> got all of it, unfortunately, or fortunately, as it were. Well, no, now that I'm here in the garage area, I'm glad you got it. I tell you what, that uh, that was about the best save I think I've ever had. That was that was big. Uh, I don't think I had anything to do with it, but uh, as far as the save, you know, I, uh, I'm not. I know Mark had had a run on me, and and uh, I started to turn in the corner, and I see him shoot underneath me, and I went to block him. And I said, Nah, I think he's there. And about that time, I don't know if we touched or just took the air off me, but boy, that thing cut sideways. You know, Jeff, there's so many dramatic moments that. Fans rarely get a chance to see leading up to the 500. So much drama during speed weeks. You know, I, oh, I think there's more sometimes in practice than there is actually in the race. Uh, and that's why a lot of times I don't like to run many laps out there practicing because it can get hairy. But you think, hey, being out front is the place to be. And the uh, car is awesome. I mean, that thing is a rocket ship. Um, you know, the track got sun on it. It's a little bit uh, looser, I think, today. So um, I need to tighten my car up a little bit. But I don't know if that had anything to do with me getting loose right there. <laughs> All right, great save. Thank you. 
So Gordon's team will make adjustments and come out again. Ken Squires here to broadcast his 36th Daytona 500 radio. He brought network television to Daytona. He's been here for every race since, so he has seen it all. And Ken, this morning, took us into the garage area where the search for speed is sometimes mission impossible. The Daytona 500 is only four days away, and I'm going to take you in to the Casablanca of the Daytona International Speedway. This, on this day, is where everything has happened. It's seething with intrigue. Excuse me, officer. This is the garage area. While they've been turning hot laps on the high banks here in the infield, cold, calculating controversy reigns. Charges and counter charges that NASCAR is favoring the Dodges. No, they're favoring the Pontiacs. No, they gave the Ford something extra after last weekend. Then there's the subterfuge and possible sabotage. Felix Savetis claims someone fingered the fuel in Jason Leffler's fuel tank, added an additive, and has cost his crew chief, Kevin Cram, a month in the NASCAR dungeon. He's demanding an investigation. Meanwhile, the collection of illegal parts, pieces, and knickknacks that the NASCAR inspectors have discovered has created what could be a new NASCAR profit stream. Look at this. You could call it a flea market for cheaters. No, no, to be politically correct, it would be a flea market for overly competitive achievers. Rumors of conspiracy, cloak and dagger stuff, clandestine activities lurk in every meeting between two men in different team uniforms. It all just goes to prove that after 43 years here at the Casablanca of the Daytona Speedway, some things never change. The Bulls are ready for 125s here tomorrow. Or the more they change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. <laughs> but, but guys, I, I know I'm prejudiced to our sport. Been in it 20 years. Y y you look at football. And a guy blocks a guy in the back. He pulls his face mask. They throw a yellow flag. They penalize him a few yards. It's never talked about again. You go to a basketball game. A guy hits a guy across the forearm as he shoots. They do it. Let him shoot a foul shot. It's never talked about again. A baseball player puts pine tart up his bat too far. They take it away from him. But in, in, in our sport, these guys are doing their job. Those crew chiefs are trying to get every advantage they can get. And Larry. it's a foul. Larry, what Sound. you're saying is it's not illegal if you don't get caught. That's exactly right. How can okay. you call it cheap? <laughs> and uh, by the way, Larry, you're preaching to the choir right you're now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight and every evening at 6 p.m. on Fox Sports Net, Steve Burns brings you totally NASCAR, a wrap-up of everything that's happened at the Speedway, and even when we're not in Daytona, everything that's happening in the sport. Weeknights at 6, right here on Fox Sports Net. There's only one hour of practice today for the Winston Cup cars, but in the garage area, things are a hum. Warming up rear end grease, making changes, discussing strategy, discussing making changes, changing engines, checking the timing, tuning things up. Timing is everything in sports. And there are the practice times so far. Ken Schrader and his teammate Johnny Benson in Pontiacs own two of the top three times, Sterling Marlin and Bill Elliott in Dodges, Dale Earnhardt and Joe Nemechek in Chevrolets, Ward Burton's Dodge, Terry Labonte in a Chevy, Robbie Gordon's Chevy, Bobby Labonte's Pontiac. Hmm, three of the four mates are in the top ten in practice times. Well, it's amazing what that draft does. You saw 47.03 being the fastest time. That's two seconds faster than Bill Elliott running his pole run on Saturday. Again, when these cars are lined up on the racetrack, another line of cars poking a hole in the air for them, they're going to run a lot faster, and that's the reason they're two seconds faster. Oh, yeah. If you've got a fast car and you get back behind all these cars right here that are going down, just coming off turn two, and you get a run on them going down the back, you pick up two or three hundred RPM and easily two or three miles an hour. Out of our Fox Whoa. box in the upper left of the screen, let's show you who's run the most laps today. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Mark Martin, and Tony Stewart in that elusive search for speed. Those are the drivers that have put on the most laps in this practice session. You know, you watch those cars fan out down that back straightaway. Folks, Nobody plans any of that. It's not like somebody turns on their signal and says, let's go this way, let's go that way. You are totally reacting off of what happens in front of you. You're following a guy, he turns dead left, you turn dead left with him. You want to go where he goes. And that's how they get all fanned. And then all of a sudden, you're three back. Hey, they went left, I'll go right. 
and then the guy back and said, I'll go through the middle. The next thing you know, you get the third turn, he said, I don't know where I'm gonna go now. <laughs> no turn signals, no brake lights, uh, very few hand signals. No, the, the basics, you know, he just got the basic signals. Jeff? Mike also looking at the practice sheets from yesterday, when Mike Skinner put it down a 47.55 the fastest time, you notice today, everybody's up almost a half a second faster. And today, the sun shines out, the pressure, barometric pressure, humidity in the air is burnt off. So today, I think guys are making more horsepower. Plus, they probably got their 125 motors in. Again, horsepower and proper conditions to get all you can out of these cars is very, very important. Dick Bergman. Want to know what the single most important piece on the race car is? There's four of them, the tires. Right now, Tony Stewart's just come off the racetrack and the tire engineers and his own guys are checking tire pressure, they're checking tire temperature to try and make sure that the weight distribution on the car is such that every tire is working as hard as possible. And last night, Tony Stewart was worrying about tires too because he was off racing a dirt track modified at the little local half mile. Tajini. Well, Dick, last year, Johnny Benson had a chance to win the Daytona 500 in an unsponsored car. Today, he's running top three, and with a big smile, Johnny just told me this car is running very, very well today. But it's also been really loose out here all week, so they decided to tighten it up, and that's the reason for the trip to the garage. It was just a little too tight. They've made the adjustment, and he's back out there on the track. Hey, Mike, you talk about, we talk about agendas, engines, and so forth. A lot of drivers uh, and crew chiefs will make runs on old tires because they know that they may not get a chance to change tires in the uh, 50 laps to the 125 so they go out on old tires to see how the car is going to respond somebody else might be out there on brand new tires and his car run a little quicker and one thing puzzles me is we watch kenny schrader number 36 who is fastest in practice thus far the quickest fords are brett bodine 13th fastest and Hut Strickland 16th fastest two of the single car non-factory back teams where are Robert Yates's Roger Penske's cars where are the guys you'd ex expect to be up there I've seen this movie before <laughs> <laughs> you know the the guys the Ford guys this is my job now so okay, I gotta Larry. talk about it that they feel like that the Dodges have a strong advantage and sometimes you can play this game to try to convince NASCAR. NASCAR likes black and white. Show me, show me the proof that, that you're at a disadvantage and uh, they might like walking a pair of that practice sheet and say, look here, we told you. Yeah, well, uh, you know what to say, Larry. That's the politics, baby. We're doing the politics thing today. And as long as we don't have to run the race till Sunday, we'll keep working on our politics and maybe we won't have to work so hard on our car. Let somebody else do it for it. Look at old Schrader back there. Schrader's a sleeping dog. You know what? He'll slip up on them now. So it's possible that the Roush, the Yates, the Penske, and some of those other top cars are not running as fast as they can because they're trying to get a concession. They don't pay a thing in this practice session. That's, uh, there you've got it. it. You know, if I'm a crew chief, Daryl, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the weather we've got here. Jeff talked about this a little bit. The motors are running better because of the air, but the cars are probably not handling as good today as they did Monday and Tuesday because the racetrack's a lot hotter. The sun's beating down on it, and it enhances more handling problems. As you heard Jeff Gordon say, his car's looser because the racetrack's a lot, lot hotter and slipperier and greasier. Yeah, the other thing, Larry, if you look at the American flag, it's hanging limp. I believe something happened to Spencer or he, I believe he had an engine problem or else he got it in the fence. I'm not sure which. A lot of smoke from behind Spencer's car as he rolls off to turn one. I think he detonated one. Caution's going to come out here during this Winston Cup practice. So Dick Bergeron has more. Walking around the garage area, Mike, you guys were talking about the politics thing. I talked to many of the crew chiefs after NASCAR took several different brands off to the wind tunnel and tested them. And what I kept consistently hearing from anybody who didn't drive a Dodge was those Dodges blew so well. What that means is that they had very little drag in comparison to the other brands, and they also had more downforce. That is exactly what you want to have. And many of the crew chiefs are quite concerned about the possibility that the Dodge may have an advantage. Or that they really want all of us in the press to think that so that we'll talk a lot about it on television and try and persuade NASCAR to give them something that Dodge doesn't have. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I was going to bring a new program to Daytona and uh, introduce it to the American public, 
I would be doing it exactly like they're doing it. I would have everybody in the country, and that's about what it is, talking about them being here at Daytona and that they have some sort of an advantage. There's the car that will start on the pole in the Daytona 500. There's another of those 10 Dodges. It is a big story because Dodge returning puts four manufac three manufacturers and four different brands in the field. Ford, Pontiac, Chevrolet, and now Dodge returning to Winston Cup. Ken Schrader tops the speed chart. Pontiac, Dodge, Pontiac, Dodge, Chevrolet, Chevrolet, Dodge. We'll be right back. You're watching Winston Cup practice on Fox Sports Net. Welcome back to Winston Cup practice for tomorrow's Gatorade 125 at Daytona International Speedway. Mike Joy with Daryl Waltrip and Larry McReynolds. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And the uh, Daytona Drive-By Wedding Chapel continues to do a land office business here in Victory Lane. You know, I, it's becoming very obvious to me that we are a full-service sanctioning body. Uh, we can provide anything you need from uh, weddings to therapy to being politically correct. Every now and then we throw a race in there. We could probably use the big red truck that everybody goes to to complain for a, a divorce mediation. <laughs> Who knows? That's been Later. a busy little place this week. Yes, it has. Yeah. It has. You got it. Might as well flaunt it, I guess. There's Matt Kent, this car. The green flag is back out. The uh, NASCAR officials checked the area from turn four to turn one for any oil there you go. Debris There's from Spencer's Jimmy Spencer, car. he's starting to smoke way back there. You can see it coming out of the left front there. Probably knocked a hole in something underneath there. Maybe it could be just an oil line, but more likely knocked a hole in the side of the oil pan, I'd say. Uh, and uh, boy, the guy that really did a good job, watch Michael right here. Because Jimmy's down, I mean, he's probably got his hand up in the air waving, and Michael's running up on him at about 190 mile an hour. So uh, everybody avoided a real, dodged a real bullet there. And uh, there you see what was the leak being cleaned off there. We've talked about the lobbying that goes on. Jeff Hammond, what have you done besides going to the NASCAR big red truck, the officials trailer, to lobby for rule changes? How do you how do you do that? Well, Mike, one thing I want to add right now is I was talking to the Gary Nelson early this morning, and Gary said they've got a new name for the big red truck. It's called the Heat Treat Room because all those crew chiefs that were sent up in the front office of the rig, they said they all went in there kind of like the blast furnace, and they came out a little bit more kneeled, they said. But uh, the things you try to do is try to make valid points for pleading your case. It's much like going into courtrooms and, and being a lawyer. You've got to go in and state your case, make sure you make valid points to the jury, and hopefully the judge and jury will kind of see it your way and rule in your favor. So are you saying that if one make is not running very fast in this practice session, that timesheet becomes their evidence? Not necessarily. It's not just that. The wind tunnel inf information. I mean, that's kind of like the smoking gun right now. NASCAR took all these cars to the wind tunnel. They came back, and guess what? Before the cars even got back to the track, the manufacturers already had the numbers and were spreading them around. I mean, if you're working for a Ford team, you automatically want to make sure all the media and all your buddies get these numbers out there because you can start hollering foul without having to do it yourself. You want somebody else talking for you, much like we're doing for them right now. Well, we saw Johnny Benson in the 10 car get real loose off the corner back there in turn yeah. four. But Jeff, you've sat in that corner of that trailer in the front and I've sat in it. No matter what the case, it has a way of humbling you out before you leave there. Oh, they're gonna let you know right quick. You can say anything you want to. The final decision is left totally up to them. They're in control and they'll let you know that right quick. And, and there's an ebb and flow to this. The make that dominated Speed Weeks last year nearly swept the top five. This year, they seem to think they're at a disadvantage. And the Chevrolets. If you just think back to one year ago, Chevrolet showed up down here with a new car. Oh, Dale Earnhardt, he didn't like the car. He didn't like the restrict. He didn't like Daytona. He didn't like nothing. He didn't even get close to the front last year. And look where they are now. So it'll all work itself out. Trust me, it'll work itself out. What a difference a year makes. Dick Bergeron? Well, right now, Kenny Schrader's the fastest man on the racetrack. His crew chief, Sammy Johns, is about to wear out this platform. He's been walking in circles here, watching his car. What do you see, Sammy? Uh, we're just trying to make sure it's still handling good right now. It's a lot hotter today than it has been all week, so we're just trying to make sure the car's still handling good. Seems to be, you know, as far as speed goes, just no matter what line you're in. Okay, well, it's looking really good. Let's go to Steve Burns. Well, Dick, a lot of work being done to the engine compartment of the number 26 of Jimmy Spencer. Jimmy's in the car. Jimmy, what happened on the racetrack? Have a problem? Uh, yeah, what happened out there was uh, we ruptured a line from the uh, oiling system to the valve springs, and uh, we're trying to fix it now and get back out. Thanks, Jimmy. 
former national NASCAR modified champion. One of the things I want to refer back to is these two guys were talking about going in and pleading your case and you have all this evidence. See, that's a lot different than it used to be. You used to go in there and make stuff up. We'd go in there and just uh, make up all kinds of things about, well, you know they got this and you know they got that and you know that you took that away from us and, you know, we refer back to previous cases. We don't necessarily have a lot of evidence. We just kind of refer back to previous cases and, oh, by the way, don't you think you owe us a little something? You know, I couldn't help, but as Dick was talking to Sammy Johns, you know, talking about making sure the car's still driving good, Sammy Johns has been the poster child for running out of fuel this week. His race car in the Bud shootout, yes. it run out in 50 laps. Now, the race isn't but 50 laps on tomorrow, but you've got to run a couple of pace laps, too. So i got to believe Sammy Johns is paying pretty close attention to fuel mileage as well. I would agree. Dale Jarrett, defending 500 champ, new colors this year. He's out there. Let's look at the drivers who have run the fewest laps in this session. Kyle Petty, only four laps. We heard of Spencer's problem. Norm Benning, Todd Bodine, Derek Cope did not spend much time on the racetrack. Hutt Strickland, Morgan Shepard, Ricky Rudd, Michael Walter, Buckshot Jones. And some other drivers that have clocked a dozen or less laps. And so Steve Allen that uh, builds those Yates motors for Spencer and those guys uh, doesn't get upset with this. Uh, it didn't uh, <coughs> detonate like it, it just had a line loose. And so our apologies, sir. I, I recall, I don't recall the driver, maybe, maybe you do, but running for a certain car owner who was also an engine builder, and uh, after the car coasted in the garage area, said they'd had an electrical problem or the starter fell off or something like that. But actually, there were connecting rod holes all through the motor. But he didn't want to get his owner upset. So oh, yeah. Electrical problem. Yeah, that's... The, the rods knocked the starter off the motor. I guess that would be an electrical that, problem. That, that you could call that ignition. That's some more of being uh, politically correct. A lot of egos in this business. Don't want to rub some people the wrong way. Nope. You, you know, you, we've, we've heard them talk about you know, handling problems today, Daryl, and I'm the crew chief now. And I've got my last two days of notes from Monday and Tuesday where it was overcast. Now I'm collecting my notes from today when it's sunny. And what they'll do, they'll come in here in the morning, and before they put that car on the line to race, they're going to look at the weather conditions. Is it more like Monday and Tuesday when it's cloudy and overcast? Or is it more like yesterday where it was real sunny? And Jeff, I'd say there'll be a lot of decisions just based on the, the different setups for the different weather conditions. Well, buddy, I'll tell you right now, you're Mr. Weatherman when it comes to that kind of situation. But as we know, as we look to tomorrow, you know, racetrack as well as conditions should be about the same. But when we look a little bit further, the way, weather's looking to change again. This racetrack is very, very sensitive to that. It affects the engines as well as the handling of these race cars. And you can't overlook that as part of the tuning part process you go through on race morning. Now, one thing that I, that I see that's different from what we've seen a lot of the days, that's his humidity. Now, even though 77% is a lot of humidity, that's a lot lower than we've seen. We've seen as much as 90% of humidity earlier in the week. Tomorrow, it's supposed to be like in the low, day, low 80s, partly cloudy. So I just, I got to believe tomorrow is going to be more like today. Yeah, and, and again, I, re I refer back to the flag. I mean, it's hanging limp. There's no wind whatsoever, and that's ideal conditions for these cars to really go fast. And one other thing we keep talking about is the fuel mileage we're trying to you know, keep folks in on. Whenever that pressure changes and those temperatures change, those motor tuners have to go back and redo their carburetors, and that can affect that fuel mileage tremendously, especially tomorrow. So that's not a good thing if the weather starts changing very much. You saw where the, the degrees tomorrow are supposed to be 81 degrees, and the one thing that was missing from that graphic is humidity because they can't forecast the humidity. They have to wait till in the morning and see where the humidity is, and they'll, they'll make their decisions on that. Larry, one other thing, too. Tape on the front of the grills. The hotter it gets, the less tape you can run, the more drag you've got. Again, it's going to affect the mileage of these cars. And one thing you guys wouldn't understand, you ain't never been out there, but I look at the windshield factor, too. For years, they've called Larry McReynolds the Willard Scott of Winston Cup, and now you know why. We're watching Winston Cup practice for tomorrow's Gatorade Twin 125. This is NASCAR on Fox Sports Net. The Bulls are ready for a central battle. Welcome back to Daytona. Four days to the Daytona 500 on Fox. Things are getting really frisky out there in Winston Cup practice. They're getting ready for the Gatorade 125s. We'll see them live for the first time, and that's tomorrow, right here at noon Eastern time on Fox Sports Net. Live coverage, first time ever. We can't wait. 
And these drivers practicing trying to dial their cars in, we asked a couple to turn their thoughts to what they'll be thinking about and hoping to do when they strap in for that race tomorrow. Running at Daytona is a 195 mile an hour chess match. It's, it's 500 miles long, it's a long race, and cars stay in a very tight, close pack. And uh, one lap you may be leading the race, the next lap you may be as far back as 10th or 12th, just in one lap. The biggest key to Daytona is, is having the car handle. Because Daytona, you, you, you start turning in the corner before you pick up the bind. It's always a racetrack. The, the car has got to drive well, got to stay on the bottom, got to be able to run that, and that's that's going to be the key to the, the 500. You have to remember, it's a team sport, and the team, as a driver, you're only one, one portion of that team. Um, maybe of a team of 50 people that really made all that happen and, and make that happen throughout the day. So everyone has to be, uh, you know, at the top of their game especially for the Daytona 500. Well, one of the things as a driver, I mean, Mark said it's a team sport. One of the things you worry about, maybe your car's good, you know you're driving well, is my pit crew as good as everybody else's? Am I going to be able to make those critical 14, 15 second pit stops? Is my pit strategy going to be good? All for the next few days, all you think about is, how can I win this race? What have I got to do? What have I got to do as a driver? What does my entire team have to do to win this race? And you spend nights thinking about that, hoping everybody will perform at 110%. I've always felt the engine builders, Daryl, are the unsung heroes of this sport. It's always, we won the race. But when they point that finger, it's your engine blew. Well, I might, I might agree or disagree, but, yep. you know, engines blow up and they just pat the engine guy on the back and go, oh, don't worry, that happens. Now, if the driver wrecks the car, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's a lot of point, finger pointing uh, if the driver takes you out of the race, uh, and particularly if he does it on a consistent basis. <laughs> so uh, I've always thought that was interesting that I don't mind them blowing up if they run. But it better be running if it blows up. You know, you see Mike Skinner's car here, and it, it's perfect timing. You talk about the engine builders. These guys, they're normally ready for practice. I, I really worked hard the three years I was there trying to be one of the first ones ready for practice. But they didn't put their engine in until the last minute this morning because the guys back in Welcome, North Carolina, was working on the 125-miler motor trying to get it down here by this morning. And they called this morning and said, guys, it just didn't turn out like we wanted. You need to go on the truck and put this motor in there. So these these guys never stop working on the Daytona 500 until there's no more time. But the pit crew, Daryl, and you mentioned it, the, these guys are athletes all winter long. They've been lifting weights. They've been practicing in 10, 15 degree weather. And guys now are making four tire stops in 12 and 13 seconds. Oh, it's it's, just, and it's a lot easier to pass them on pit road than it is out there on that racetrack. Well, that's what you always tell the crew. You know, if you'll pass three or four in the pits, I'll try to pass three or four on the racetrack. And first thing you know, we'll be up front. But Bill Elliott said it best, the car that handles it, Daytona. Oh, yeah. That's the one that's going to yeah. go down into where all them people have been getting married this week. That's right. You're going to be a real happy marriage over on Sunday. There's about uh, 15 minutes left to this practice session. <laughs> it's rush hour. Well, Everybody it looks like out. 10 to go to me. Yeah. It looked like they gave him 10 to go, and they said, look, you're not in the race yet. Because these guys are... Uh, Ten like, minutes left on the schedule to this practice a lot of session. moves that I just don't think that are necessary. But you know, you talk about taking an engine back to welcome North Carolina. Now, used to, we'd come down here and somebody'd say they flew their engine back home. We'd say, man, you please, man, they took that motor all the way back home to work on it. Now everybody does it. I mean, they got a, like a car, cargo plane over there carrying motors all over the place. I'd be willing to bet the Daytona 500, because I worked with him for six years, the Daytona 500 motors for the 8828 of Robert Yates, I bet they're not even in Daytona. I bet those guys back in Charlotte are still working on them. I bet you're right. Three wide again through the tri-oval and back off to turn number one. Jeff Burton said in a tape piece earlier this week, he said, this, this track, you just can't, it's not wide enough. You can't run three wide around here. Well, they didn't widen the racetrack. They didn't narrow up the cars, but this is what we've seen all through practice since qualifying. Steve Burns. 
Well, Mike, I'll tell you how much tension there is here in this garage area. Moments ago, Dave Blaney's crew was pushing his number 93 back into his garage stall. Steve Park was trying to drive back in. They had a little altercation. Steve Park got impatient and actually hit the left front corner of that number 93 car. Hey, that's one of those things that give crew chiefs nightmares. There is yellow paint on the left front corner of that car, but as near as we can tell just by looking, that left front corner has not been damaged. But I'll tell you this, Dave Blaney's crew is not too happy about it. It's just like in a parking lot. I mean, that's what it's like down there. They got everything down there but grocery carts. <laughs> <laughs> There's parks number one in yellow and black. Finding a, a home there in the high lane. Man, they, somebody wow. back there got way up high. Yeah, and that, it's like a parking lot out here on the racetrack. And here's the, look, there are 52 teams in this one little area right here, plus haulers. You ought to see them pack all that stuff in there. And they got their tires, they got the engine hoist to change engines, they got their cool down machines to cool radiators. I mean, you, you name it, it's there, and it's hard to pull in your garage stuff. It is. Well, guys, I want to point out one thing. Think about it like this. We have all those people packed in that one little bitty area. Just think about how good a job everybody does as a whole. Guys work very good together. Drivers are respectful of the crews. A lot, you know, we have an opportunity for people to get hurt every day in that garage area because of the professionalism of the drivers and the teams. I mean, we do a really good job, I think, of just taking care of business. And it's crowded. When I signed in oh, a week ago on Tuesday, early, very early in the game, they'd already signed out 2,400 credentials for that garage area. And since then, I know they've signed out a whole lot more. Yeah, Media I told some friends of mine, I said, this is, I brought a friend of mine, that, they, they wanted to come to a race. I said, well, it's hard to get a pass. I said, because the garage area is a highly restricted area. And we got there and you couldn't even walk through the garage area. See Mike Skinner here talking to Dale Earnhardt. I'm sure that, you know, Mike's telling Dale about how his car is driving. And uh, looks like Mike might be saying, you like that open face helmet, Dale? <laughs> uh, well, we saw Jimmy Spencer with one. So maybe that curve is moving the other way, that trend uh, between the closed and open face helmet. Jeff Gordon uh, getting filled up at the gas pump. We'll be right back. On our new program, Totally NASCAR, Steve Burns every weeknight at 6 p.m. here on Fox Sportsnet, your new home for news about NASCAR. Just about four minutes to go in this practice session. The two Robert Yates cars out there together, Ricky Rudd and Dale Jarrett. Nowhere near this swarm. There they are. They're just running by themselves. The thing about it, they won't be able to work with each other tomorrow because Dale Jarrett is actually in the first 125 miler. Ricky Rudd will actually start 10th in the second 125 miler. You know, Larry, I'm curious about something. You got uh, three team cars there of Earnhardt's. Why wouldn't you get on the same uh, radio channel and talk to each other all the time? You know, we, we talk to, to Mike and Dale about that a lot. Uh, about talking to each other, and, and I don't think neither one of them was, was very comfortable. But I know as a crew chief, I would scan a lot of teams, and I know Jeff Burton and Mark Martin talked to each other. They'd even talk to each other racing sometimes. Yeah, that's what it is. Rusty and Jeremy Mayfield would talk to each other, Tony Stewart and Bobby Labonte, but uh, I don't know. They just never got comfortable with doing it. Well, I believe everybody's decided to go out here in the last three yeah. or four minutes. Got to get that final plug check. But it seems to me like that, you know, like if Michael's running alongside a park there, and he says, I need in, and he hollers over, that's lets me in and it gives him a little room, you know? Well, the fellow, Darrell, who is atop the speed chart is not out there right now. Dick Bergman's with him. And as Kenny Schrader looks good on the speed chart, what's it feel like behind the wheel? Uh, it feels real good. I mean, the m and finally has been good since we unloaded it. And that was the other one, but uh, got to fill it up with fuel. We had full fuel last time, just couldn't go that many laps. And uh, we're ready to go for tomorrow. We'll see what happens. Tell me about the fuel thing, Kenny. You did run out. Are you going to be able to get that thing to go a little bit further for tomorrow's twins? We ran out because we got black flag on lap 17 for uh, spewing out a little bit of oil. And uh, when NASCAR elected to let us go, but we made her stop, uh, we'd already made her stop, and at lap 17, we couldn't make it then. Uh, the whole Hendrick engine group's worked real hard on fuel mileage since then, 
that would have been 53 laps, and uh, we feel we can do that now. So we got got to be able to run like 51 to, to make Sunday's race or Thursday's 125s. Got to run 51 in a 50 lap race, guys. <laughs> well, he's got a pace lap. Yeah, you got two pace laps at least. And yeah. Each of those is probably worth about what one green flag lap is as far as fuel consumption. Uh, a good rule of thumb is two caution laps or two pace laps is equal to one green flag yeah. lap. And these cars hold tentatively 22 gallons of fuel. For the most part, I'm hearing people get anywhere from about 5.5 to 6 miles a gallon, a little over, little over two laps. So, uh, uh, again, that's what you're going to have to get to be able to run the distance. And, Larry, let me just say, uh, they held 22 gallon of fuel uh, last Friday when they was going through inspection. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been almost a week ago now. Them things will grow on you a little bit. So, uh, by, expansion. Uh, yeah, I've got a little expansion going on. Here are the drivers who've been working hard in this practice session. Jason Luffler's put 47 laps up. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Jerry Nadeau, 45 apiece. And on down through the drivers who've had the most track time in this hour. And, and I think that's important. These guys may not be happy with their cars, but I think it's so important, and it's important to me as a crew chief to be consecutive laps. You want to get those those tires heat soaked. You want them to, to really get starting to wear down because that's when if a car's going to really start pushing or not turning or get loose, that's when it's going to happen is when the tires really get wore down. And as a driver, you want to leave here this afternoon. You want to get out of this car right now when this session's over saying, I love my car. I'm happy with my car. I like it on new tires. I like it on old tires. I am pleased with my car. I'm going to the hotel. Folks, That's you've been what watching. Like to hear uh, you say too. <laughs> you've been watching these Winston Cup cars. Let's give them a listen. send some of that salt breeze from the Atlantic Ocean and some of this 80 degree temperature and the smell of tire rubber into your living room, then we'll be all set. We're in the closing minutes of Winston Cup practice for tomorrow's Gatorade 125 that you will see live right here. You're watching Winston Cup action from Daytona on Fox Sports Net. It's a Valentine's Day battle on Fox. This great two and a half mile speedway has grown strangely silent as the red and black flags have come out signaling an end to this Winston Cup practice session. Flag man's packing up his laundry and going home. And so are we on Fox Sports Net. Lots more activity on the track today and you'll see all of it on Totally NASCAR tonight at 6 p.m. with Steve Burns. Ken Schrader had the fastest time in a Pontiac. Then it was the Dodge of Sterling Marlin, second fastest. Then a Pontiac, a Dodge, a Pontiac. A Chevy, a Chevy, a Chevy, a Dodge, and a Chevy. That's how the top 10 times look in this practice session. We'll be back with final thoughts and wrap up this final Winston Cup practice before the qualifying races right after this. Welcome back to Daytona where Winston Cup practice is ended. Folks, they'll race anything here in Daytona Beach. I know why Schrader quit practice early. He's up there racing one of those blimps because he'll race anything. Tomorrow, the Gatorade 125, live on Fox Sports Net to set the field for the Daytona 500. Dick Bergeron. Ken Schrader has just won practice. Bill Elliott won the pole. But nobody, absolutely nobody, has shown enough strength and dominance to be considered a clear favorite for Sunday's Daytona 500. Stick around on Fox. This is about to get real good. To Steve. Well, Dick, I can tell you who lost practice. Petty Enterprises, Kyle Petty and Johnny Andretti, both significantly slower than they were yesterday. So some anxious, long hours for crew chief Chris Hussey and Greg Stedman here at Petty Enterprises. Jeannie? Steve, so close last year at the Daytona 500. Johnny Benson working real hard on this car today. Too tight, too loose, trying to get it just right. I asked him how the car was and if they were ready. He said, look, you're never ready, but there's still some work to be done. Chris? 
All right, thanks, Jeannie, and our team in the pit crew. It's been a good week, a, a good day for Dodge, but not for Casey Atwood, another shaky practice. I'm telling you right now, Chris, I really believe it'd be not one of those sleepless nights for Ray Everham. Casey Atwood's not up to speed, and he needs to get baby brother into the race. He's a guy who could miss the cut, and they talk about that show survival. Tomorrow's twin 125s could be a survival for many. If, if they don't do well there, they're out, Karen. It's a survival of the former Daytona 500 winners here in that first 125 miler. Here you've got uh, Elliott starting with Jarrett in the first row. You've got Marlon and Gordon row two. There's Dale Jarrett back in 14th, and then Derek Cope starting 21st, and that second race is just a plain old free-for-all. All right, Jeff, let's go back to Ford to talk about to who's sandbagging. Are they holding back a little, not wanting to show us too much again today? It looks awful conspicuous all of a sudden. You can't find a Ford in the top 15. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's really, really strange, especially who's up there close to the front, Brett Bodine. All right, Ford dominated last year. Remember, they finished one through five at the Daytona 500. For a complete wrap-up of NASCAR, watch Totally NASCAR with Steve Burns tonight, every night. 6 Eastern on Fox Sports Net. Tomorrow, a showdown at high noon. The twin 125s we talked about. First time ever that you'll see that live. It'll be broadcast both races here on Fox Sports Net. So to wrap things up here at Daytona, Dodge, another big day. Two of the top four practice times, including pole sitter Bill Elliott. For Ken Squire and Jeff Hamlin here at our studio setup, I'm Chris Myers. Just four days until the Daytona 500. You'll see it on Fox. Thanks for watching Fox Sports Net. Have a good one. Happy Valentine's Day.